Boy, those Pharisees just don't seem to get it. What is their problem with Jesus and his ministry anyway? They always seem to be out to catch him on something. And Jesus always seems to be butting up against them on one thing or another. Strangely enough, it seems to me that one of the problems here is that the Pharisaic movement appears to have more in common with the Jesus movement than with many others living in first century Palestine. They have so much in common that the Pharisees and the Jesus people end up spending more time together too, which is why we keep hearing about them. The Pharisees and the Jesus followers were both Jewish groups living in first century Palestine, which was under Roman occupation. To the Pharisees, the Roman occupation is unacceptable. To Jesus and his disciples, the Roman occupation is unacceptable. This poverty, the lack of autonomy, the hunger, the violence and oppression under military and economic occupation is unacceptable. The kingdom of God must be restored. The kingdom and the power of the spirit must return to the people. To that end, the Pharisees studied scripture and followed the law of Moses very, very seriously. See, the Pharisees were very, very serious. They took scripture very seriously. They took their religion very seriously, and they took it very seriously when the scripture says that the Jews will be a priestly nation. They believed that the Jews should be setting themselves apart from other ethnicities and nations and keeping themselves ritually pure and ritualistically following the law of Moses. Now I know that about 200 of you have recently read through the Bible during the Bicentennial Challenge, so you're probably well aware of this, but the law of Moses can be a little bit ambiguous. Take hand washing, for example. Back then, they didn't have signs like literally everywhere telling people exactly how to wash their hands for at least 20 seconds between every single activity. Washing hands at that time wasn't common. Washing hands was a ritual that set people apart. The words clean and unclean in this scripture aren't really referring so much to germs as to ritual purity. Clean meant something more like cleared for religious practices, and unclean just meant common. There is a requirement included in the book of Exodus for priests to use a bronze basin to wash their hands before entering the tent of the Lord when they go to make and eat sacrifices. Um, they eat the sacrificial meat in God's presence. So the Pharisees, taking this very seriously, want to be very sure that they follow this law. So they have a ritual basin with which the priests can wash their hands before making and eating those sacrifices. However, it's possible that someone might fall through the cracks and accidentally break the law. So the Pharisees create more rituals. Now, anyone bringing the meat to be sacrificed also has to wash their hands and feet. But it's still possible that a person might inadvertently leave their hands unwashed during the sacrifice process. So the Pharisees make more rituals. A priest might accidentally eat sacrificed meat without washing their hands. So the, the Pharisees make more rituals until we get to the point where priests have to wash their hands and feet before eating anything. But these Pharisees think, you know, wouldn't it be better if we all just followed the same rituals as the priests since we're supposed to be a priestly nation? And so they create, you guessed it, more rituals. And now they say that anyone who eats anything should ritualistically wash their hands 
just in case. If you think about this, it might not seem like such a wild idea. After all, there were people who believed that the Roman occupation was punishment for the sins of the Jewish people. And then there were people who didn't necessarily think that, but who had a kind of strong sense that things weren't going well, and a vague sense that things could go better if people did better. Now that's not so strange, is it? People throughout history understand vaguely that social evil reflects moral failure, and yet only rarely get the specifics right. Humanity hasn't yet evolved from war or witch hunt. And as far as religious reform goes, the Pharisees weren't so bad. They focused on themselves and how they could set themselves apart with their exceptional purity through creating more rituals for themselves to follow. I can see the attraction. We haven't yet evolved from this ourselves. As a parent, I see this every day. There is always something more that we need to be doing just in case. I know, it's important to read to your children, so we have rituals of reading before bed. It's important to keep our children healthy, so we have rituals of taking our vitamins every morning and washing our hands and masking up. It's important to bathe our children, and so another ritual. But uh, there's added pressure to make sure that we've got them listening to music. But not just any music, the right kind of music, the kind that makes them smarter more rituals with music classes, and learning an instrument in case they want to be a musician, more rituals with piano lessons and practice. And it's probably good to have them learning like Mandarin or German or Spanish, more rituals. And, you know, in case they want to go to an Ivy League school someday, we really ought to have them go to a tutor. So more rituals with studying. In case they want to play any sport in college. Parents, are you with me on this one? I've heard that we need to be having our kids play starting at age three if they want to play in college someday. So they should be playing year-round uh, swim and soccer and cheer and karate and baseball, maybe all five or six or seven every night of the week, just in case. We ought to add some more rituals. Unfortunately for my two children, outside of teaching them a love for reading and music and learning, we don't do almost any of these rituals with them. That has a lot to do with COVID. But there is this pressure to add more rituals to our life. Because eating less sugar is good, and giving them opportunities for success is good. But sometimes the more, more, more becomes too much, and we forget how to just be with our children. And just being with our children is the heart of parenting. Good people find themselves in this pharisaic spiral all the time, don't we? There's always something more that we could be doing, or maybe even should be doing. So we create for ourselves more rituals. We add more to our plate. We stretch ourselves thinner and thinner every year. Anyway, I should probably get around to addressing the scripture lesson for today at some point. So uh, the Gospels. Those Gospels, they indicate that Jesus quickly attracted many more followers to his movement than did the Pharisees. And I imagine that naturally they were feeling a little bit competitive. But their problem with Jesus was also with his teaching. The Pharisaic movement was to very seriously follow a extreme, an extremely uh, strict set of rituals to maintain religious purity. It necessarily involved isolation and separation from others. The problem was that this liberation from oppression through self-righteousness tends to lead to an abdication of social responsibility through personal piety. But Jesus didn't isolate himself. He taught us that none of us can abdicate ourselves from social responsibility. And while that sounded really attractive to people who had, 
you know, a vague sense that something was wrong and who were looking to do something about it, it sounded pretty threatening to people who thought that they already had all the answers. The Pharisees believed that because they practiced all the right rituals and because they had the most rituals, because they prayed and they studied and they went to church and they tithed and they gave to the poor, and because they sacrificed not just enough, but more than enough, because they held themselves to such a high standard that they were good. They believed that they were sanctified through their ritual. And here is Jesus who opens his sermon saying, change your hearts and lies. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. And the Pharisees, believing this too, perk up. But when people ask Jesus what they need to do to inherit the kingdom, he isn't giving them a set of uh, standardized laws to follow, is he? In today's lesson, we find a little spat between the Pharisees and Jesus. The Pharisees are all riled up because Jesus' disciples eat without washing their hands. And Jesus starts off by responding that they are upset with him for not following their rituals. He points out that they are pointing their fingers at him and his disciples as though not following their long list of more, 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 more rituals is doing some possible unintentional harm. And Jesus turns it on them and says, listen, you hold tighter to your own rituals than to God's commandments. Nothing we consume can make us unclean. Okay. Jesus doesn't say, you know, that's overkill. But aren't we kind of thinking it? Are we thinking that Jesus is like, your laws don't really matter. What matters, the only thing that matters, is that what's in your heart. Because that's not exactly what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't give us permission to not wash our hands or to wear a mask. Jesus doesn't say that the laws don't matter. Jesus doesn't say that we can do basically whatever we want as long as we are kind and love God in our hearts. Jesus doesn't even say that the Pharisees are going about this all wrong. He doesn't outright reject them or their methods. Jesus is making a very specific and very nuanced observation here. The Pharisees are very serious about these rituals that humans have come up with to protect themselves from impurity and evil just in case. This text is entirely focused on what defiles it is focused on impurity, on uncleanliness, on sin, on evil. And Jesus says that there isn't anything one can consume that can make them impure. Instead, the evil comes from within our hearts. This is radical. This is surprising even. It catches us off guard. Instead of abdicating us from responsibility, it gets us all on the hook. If there is nothing outside of our own heart that can make us impure, when we are setting out to follow Jesus, when we are setting out to fight evil and injustice, when we are out there looking for the problem, there is really only one place to focus then, isn't there? Some might say that in this text, Jesus is making all foods clean to eat. Or even that Jesus says it doesn't matter what we do as long as we do it in love. But that is not the point of this text. And I don't think that we should be jumping to a free-spirited rebellion of allowing all things without first addressing the topic at hand. Evil comes from our own hearts. With this, Jesus offers an invitation to reframe how we address the problem of evil and injustice. Instead of immediately jumping to self-righteous finger-pointing, instead of rushing to do something to make ourselves feel like we are on the right side, we are invited to first examine our own hearts, to do our own work. If we want to make a difference, 
we must first make a change in our own hearts. This harkens back to Jesus' thesis that the entry point to the kingdom of heaven is a changed heart and a changed life. Don't we, too, like the Pharisees, have the tendency to build our own kingdom of rituals to protect us from this reality? Don't we gravitate toward the people with whom we already agree? Don't we have a pattern of behavior, a ritual even, when we're challenged? Take the problem of racism, for example. In anti-racism work with other white people, I have seen the tendency for so many of us when confronted with the evil of racism to do a few things. We rush to do something. We rush out to a rally or to put a sign in our yard. We look at other people's overt racism as relatively worse than our own. Or we blame the victims of racism for their actions. All of this serves to protect ourselves or our hearts from examination. All of this serves to prove to ourselves or to prove to others that we're the good ones, right? But Jesus is inviting us to consider how the evil of racism is perpetuated in our hearts and minds. And the entry point to building up the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom of justice and equality for all, begins with changed hearts and lives. When we begin to engage our own hearts, we begin to see a real difference being made. The Pharisees looked to solve the problem of evil by making an elaborate lifestyle of rituals to protect themselves from doing any harm. But today, Jesus confronts our own Pharisaic natures to do more, more, more to prove our own goodness with the reality of our own complicity in doing them, doing harm. Instead of creating more rituals, Jesus invites us to create a new ritual. When we want to do more good, we also need to reflect on doing no harm. The Discipleship Project class meetings will be launching over the next few months, and this is a gift of a new ritual, which will give small groups the opportunity to directly reflect not only on how we are doing all the good we can, but also on how we may be doing harm. These small groups will serve as a place for us to center our souls. And rather than seeing it as one more thing, I hope that you will see discipleship as a new Thing, a different thing. Christ invites us to follow with a changed heart, and it's simple. Friends, a changed heart is a growing one. A changed heart is one that has acknowledged that we just might not have it all exactly right. We all fall short. It's part of being human, but we do more good by growing together, and we grow together by first acknowledging that we need to grow. We don't necessarily grow by adding more to our plate. More and more and more rituals don't often mean real growth. But my friends, new rituals do. Thanks be to God. Amen.